Good evening everyone and welcome to class two of our intro to corporate governance syllabus for the second semester of a very interesting 2020 where we continue to engage with each other in a rather different way from what we're used to. I hope one day we do get to meet in person and um, if you are uh, ever in the same room as me in the future please come and introduce yourself because uh, I really love meeting the people on the other side of the screen. So today as I said it's the second lecture part of the syllabus it's the lecture that takes place and is scheduled for the 4th of August um, it is available on my YouTube channel and remember that you can ask me questions on the YouTube channel and make comments and um, I will respond to those um, hopefully we can get a more virtual classroom up and running as soon as possible and see if we can engage with, with each other a little bit more personally so today we're going to talk about types of business entities. Now, you will remember from class one and the two videos that made up class one that when we look at corporate governance um, and we look at it from the perspective of the company secretary and, and actually running a business, we look at it predominantly through the eyes of a company. And, but you don't necessarily need to run your business as a company. A company is a special type of business entity. And there are other business entities which are equally suitable, uh, depending on the circumstances, for people to run their business through. What is important to remember is that corporate governance applies to all sorts of business entities, whether they are companies or very, very small entities and just one person running the business or a very large state owned entity such as ESCOM or Prasa or Transnet. So let's go through these different types of business entities and have a look at how they are structured. Let's start with understanding what separate juristic personality means, legal personality. And what this means is that a company, not a sole proprietorship um, or a partnership, um, but a company is a separate legal entity. And I did explain this concept in our class one lectures. It's like a person. It has rights. It has obligations. Um, it, ha it has a structure. It exists. It even has a little birth certificate in terms of its registration papers at SIPC. Um, it has its own personality. What it can't do is act on for itself. It needs someone to act on its behalf. Um, this separate legal personality, as I said, means that it has its own assets and its own obligations. It can, it can enter into contracts. It can be sued. And that also means that directors and shareholders are then somewhat protected because it is not them in their personal capacity that is conducting the business or entering into the contract. It is the company that is entering into the contract. So if the contract is breached or a claim is made against the company, then the company must pay from its assets, not from the individual shareholder or director. However, Everything has to be done with good intention. So if you have a company that's been set up by a director, uh, set up by a shareholder and, and, a, and a, who's appointed directors or may also be the director, but the purpose is really not um, honest. The purpose is actually to try and hide behind this company structure and the protection that a company gives you through the separate legal personality. Then what the court can do is pierce this corporate veil and say, you know what, I'm still going to hold you personally responsible because you acted in a reckless behavior and you, you did not act with the best interests of this company at heart. So you could set up an entire group of companies, but if they don't actually behave like a companies and in a corporate environment as one would expect a company to, and they are really just a sham for directors and shareholders to hide behind so that they can illegitimately use these structures to defraud 
uh, contractors or third parties that they deal with, then the company, the courts can actually pierce this corporate veil and still hold shareholders and directors accountable. So we will talk a lot about um, personal liability later on in this course. But for the purposes of understanding the different types of business structures, it's important to remember which ones have separate legal personality and which ones do not. If you have a look through your textbook, which you must refer to on a regular basis, and let me just wave it at you so you can see it. It's this lovely book by Everingham and Wexley with an update by Karen Lowe. Karen Lowe is the company secretary of Roynet. Uh, Everyone in the industry who's been in the industry for, for anything longer than five years has had to refer to Everingham and Wixley. It's the simplest explanation that you'll provide that you'll be able to find for everything that uh, you will need to cover in your career. When you buy these textbook textbooks, remember that you can keep them and you can continue to refer to them throughout your career. So it's not a grudge purchase. And um, I often still have to go and check up on things. So in Everingham and Wexley and Lowe, um, they explain these different business entity structures in quite a lot of detail. What I've done on my screen is I've given you a grid whereby I'm going to take you through all the separate aspects of these different business entities. And this is just a learning tool for me. But please make sure that you understand and you read the entire text in the textbooks. Okay, let's start out with sole proprietorships. This is a scenario where one individual is running a business for themselves. They are running it in their own name. Me, Karen Robinson, I'm running my own business. I'm setting up my bank account in my name, Karen Robinson. The contract between the bank and, and myself is, is, is in, on a personal level and it's like a personal bank account even though I run it for a business. I might de decide to call myself Karen Robinson Trading as Lectures Are Us. That's absolutely fine but at the end of the day it's still my personal capacity in which I am acting. So there's no naming convention. Only those laws that would apply to me as an individual will apply to this business entity, so the Companies Act will not apply. It's not an incorporated entity and it has no separate legal personality. The only owner, if you can call it an owner, would be me. It's me. I'm running my own business in my own name. So there's no governing body in terms of a board. It's just me. I make the decisions. Therefore, full legal responsibility for everything that this business does falls to me in my personal capacity. I don't need to have any founding documents. I don't need to have a memorandum of incorporation or any particular agreements. I need to, if I'm going to enter into any agreements for this business, I'll be entering into them as Karen Robinson in my personal capacity. If I die, this business dies with me. It doesn't continue. All of the assets of the business and the liabilities of the business will go into my estate and my poor family will have to deal with it. My bank account will be closed and thus whatever business transactions had to go through that. But that account will obviously be hampered by the fact that the business has essentially died with me. So that's a an important consideration when going into a sole proprietorship. There is no perpetual succession of the business. If I want to dissolve this business, I simply stop running it. I decide, you know what, not for me anymore. I'm going to stop running this business and I just pack up shop. Alternatively, I might die, in which case the business just ends a natural cause. Partnerships is exactly the same as a sole proprietorship. However, in this instance, I decide to chum up with somebody else. So say I decide that Karen Lowe, who contributed to this lovely book, and I decide, you know what, let's, let's do this together. So it operates exactly like a sole proprietorship, but we're now doing it together. Again, the legislation that would apply to individuals will apply to us individually in our individual capacity. Our partnership has no separate legal personality. It, by its very nature, a partnership has to be two or more people. There's no real limitation on 
partnerships. There's no governing law of partnerships. You will not find a partnership act. Um, we, between ourselves, will decide how we govern our relationship. And we can decide between ourselves who will be responsible for what. However, because we are still acting in our individual capacities, uh, third parties can still sue us in our individual capacity. So we can be held jointly and severally liable. And what that means is that um, a annoyed contractor could sue both Karen and I. Alternatively, they could sue her or they could just sue me. There's no responsibility on them to, to pick which one. They can sue either of us or both of us, and we can both be held responsible for whatever obligations it was that we committed to in our personal capacities on behalf of this business entity. We can conclude a business, uh, a business partnership agreement between ourselves, so we can um, decide this is how we're going to operate our business, but it's only effective between the two of us. Third parties can't rely on this agreement, um, and we can only use it to sue each other if we decide to have a big fallout. Of course, if one of us dies, it has the same succession planning or perpetual succession lack thereof in, as it would for a sole proprietorship. So one of us dies, the partnership will die too. Um, and if we decide that we don't want to be in business together, then we simply dissolve it. If there's a partnership agreement, then that agreement will determine how we go about um, dissolving our partnership and it will be done on that basis. Now, trust is a very funny and peculiar thing through which to do business. Historically, trusts were quite popular to do business through because there were tax benefits to doing it. Those tax benefits no longer exist. So the whole purpose of a trust originally is to hold an asset on behalf of somebody else who cannot use that asset or hold that asset on their own or for their own benefit for the time being. Like, for example, if parents pass away and they have small children, then the parents' estate or their money and assets is put into the trust. And there is a trustee who then looks after the assets and decides how those assets will be used to benefit those minor children until such times they become adults and they can maybe inherit some of those assets once they're old enough to do so. It is not designed to run a business. It is governed by the Trust Property Control Act, which is very, very different from the Companies Act. It is not an incorporated entity. It feels like it is because you have this trust and the trust exists and there is a trust deed, but it is not an incorporated entity. The trustees become in their official capacity the owners of that trust property and they become responsible for that trust property. So they can still be sued in their personal capacity to the extent that they are trustees um, for those assets. So if you've ever seen a lawsuit where you might have, have a name of an individual that says Karen Robinson N.O. after it, it means nomino officio, and it's a nominated capacity, I'm being sued in my capacity as a trustee. So the, it's not the trust itself that gets sued. So there is a distinction in terms of its, its separate legal personality it doesn't have the same sort of separate legal personality as a company would. You would have a board of trustees that would be set up by the trust deed and the trust deed would tell you how this board had to be constituted and who had to sit on it. As I explained, then you would have each of those trustees would be um, operating on, to in, uh, on behalf of the trust, but in to, to a degree of their personal capacity in this nominated position. The founding document would be the trust deed, which would appoint the trustees and explain what was going to happen to all the assets and would really govern the entire relationship. Once that um, the entire purpose for the trust being set up had been achieved, then that, that trust would come to an end. You can have trusts that continue, but those are trusts that have assets that can continue to come in. These are typically charitable trusts that are set up where people are going to make donations for many, many years. So the board of trustees will receive those donations on behalf of the trust, and then the trustee will tell them how those the, those assets and those donations have to be distributed. 
but essentially it does come to an end. It has no perpetual succession uh, and it will be dissolved in terms of the trust deed. Close corporations is the first time where we see separate legal personality. Now, close corporations were something that existed in our old Companies Act um, dispensation under our 1973 Companies Act. The close corporations had their own act called the, Co the Close Corporations Act. And it was essentially a simpler way of having a company or doing business. So the naming convention was that you would have CC after it, governed by the Closed Corporations Act. After the New Companies Act came into effect in 2001, no new closed corporations could be started. So it's a very difficult type of business format to do business in nowadays. Closed corporations do have separate legal personality. So the CC itself would be sued or would own the assets. But instead of having directors and shareholders in the same way that a company does, it has members. And these members then contribute something to this CC, be it their time, their expertise, some sort of asset, uh, money, and they put it all together. So it's a little bit like a partnership in that sense. Up to 10 people get together and they put in all of these sort of assets and attributes that the business can use to run. And they are both directors and shareholders uh, in, in a sense. They both own part of the, this closed corporation and they also um, have responsibilities to take care of this closed corporation, but it's merged into one concept, which is a member. You can only have up to 10 members. So if you need two pizzas in order to feed them, then you've got too many people around the table. So it is limited in its structure. It has that separate legal personality. But again, if there are members who are using that separate legal personality in order to defraud third parties or not for a good intention at all, then they can be held personally liable for contracts or whatever actions it is that they took on the, in the name of these closed corporations. Closed corporations do have a formal founding document. It's called a founding statement. It is similar to an MOI or a memorandum of incorporation, which companies rely on, and it dictates how this closed corporation is going to operate. In some ways, it's also very similar to what you might expect to find in a partnership agreement, where it will say how much um, of the closed corporation is owned by each member, based on the value of their contribution, how they extricate themselves from it, how they, they operate, who has authority to do what. And that founding document can also be relied upon by members of the, of, of the public, third parties who want to contract with this close corporation so that they have some sort of an understanding of what the legal arrangements are that they're getting involved in. It does have perpetual succession in the sense that when a member passes away, then the closed corporation doesn't fall apart like it would if it was a partnership. It continues and the founding statement will deal with what happens to that member's share. Typically, the member's share would go into their personal estate and, and be uh, dealt with in terms of their will. Uh, there are other ways in which the founding statement could deal with that. If you wanted to get rid of your CC, you would dissolve it. It needs to be formally dissolved through the, through the uh, CIPC um, in terms of the Closed Corporations Act um, and in terms of the founding statement, and they can be liquidated. Now we get on to companies. There are lots of different types of companies. So before you panic, I am going to go into more detail on each of these different types of companies and what makes them different from each other. But let's speak generally about companies. Now, companies is where you do see the separate legal entity um, in play, governed by the Companies Act. Uh, they are incorporated entities. They have the separate legal personality like, an, like, uh, like a human being. The owners are the shareholders, and the shareholders each own a slice of the pie of this company. And that pie is sliced up into different portions called your share capital, 
and so certain shareholders will own certain percentages of that share capital, depending on how they've made their arrangements between themselves. It is governed by a board of directors. The directors are appointed to take care of the company. They are accountable to the shareholders for how they do that, and they are responsible to the company to ensure that they act in the best interests of the company. The shareholders and the directors may be the same individual human beings. So I, Karen, can be a shareholder in my company, and I can also be a director in my company. It all depends um, whether I need other directors on what sort of company I've got. My founding document will be my memorandum of incorporation. This is like the Bible of this company. It's like it sets out all the parameters in which this company can operate in terms of the powers of the shareholders, the powers of the directors, um, and what opportunities or, or powers those parties have to, to use the assets of the business and to engage with third parties. The MOI is a public document. You can go and find the MOI of any registered company. Um, you have to go and get it from SIPC, and, and that's easier said than done. But in theory, it is available available to the public, so the public do know the basis on which they are engaging with this company. It has perpetual succession, so all the directors could die, all the shareholders could die, and this company will still be alive. And I promise you, I have had an incident where I had a small uh, shelf company that I was taking care of, it had two directors. The one director resigned on the Friday, and so it was left with one director, which was absolutely fine, and we were going to appoint another director. Uh, on Sunday, the other director passed away. And this company was left with no directors. Not very hard to fix. The shareholders then had to appoint directors. Um, but the point being that the company still continued to engage and live and survive and and uh, exist completely aside from the fact that it had, had lost both of its directors in one weekend. Let's look at the responsibilities around producing financial statements and having audit committees and having uh, your financial statements audited and the roles of company secretaries and the social and ethics committee. So a sole proprietorship, me, myself, I and Karen, just me on my own, there is no obligation on me to produce any sort of financial statement. I'm engaging with myself. It's my own money. If I lose it, I blow it, whatever. It's on me that that happens. So therefore, I don't need to be audited. Obviously, the tax man is very interested in my income. So this doesn't preclude me from Income Tax Act, and I still have to pay my tax. But I don't need to be audited. I also therefore do not need an audit committee and I don't need a social and ethics committee and I don't need to appoint a company secretary. Partnerships, very similar to sole proprietorships, but now we're talking about more than one person. So unless the partnership agreement says that financial statements need to be um, produced, there is no obligation by law to do so. Uh, again, only need to be audited if the partnership agreement requires it. It's unlikely that there would ever be any voluntary um, accepting an audit committee or forming an audit committee on a partnership. That would be a very silly thing to do. And there's no legal obligation to do that or to have a social and ethics committee or to have a company secretary. If it's only a couple of people doing business together, you really don't need those structures in place. In terms of a trust, the um, trust control property property tr trust property control act i beg your pardon does say that a trust deed um, the and the trustees will dictate how the financials need to be de dealt with so there is a duty to produce annual financial statements over a certain period of time i think it's once every 3 years um, unless the trust deed uh, uh, has a different regime uh, it will only need to be audited if the trust deed says so. The Trust Property Control Act does not require the, the annual financial statements to be audited. There is no legal obligation for an audit committee or a social and ethics committee. 
nor will the appointment of a company secretary. Trusts will normally require the appointment of some sort of an officer, uh, which might be referred to as a principal officer if it was a beneficiary fund. But otherwise, the trustees would be the, the parties who took care of the assets. Closed corporations have no responsibility to produce annual financial statements unless the founding statement says as much. So if you've got 10 people who've come together and they've all put in quite a bit of assets, then you would expect that it would be in the best interests of this business to produce financial statements. Uh, everybody's going to want to be able to measure their share. So it's most likely that the founding statement will require uh, financial statements to be produced. And then the founding statement will also determine whether or not they, those uh, financials need to be audited. There is no legal obligation to have an audit committee or a social and ethics committee, nor to appoint a company secretary. Financial statements of companies, however, do start to, to become mandatory quite early on. And at this point, I just want to, to explain why that is. There is a concept called the public interest score, and we will have a look at that in a few slides, and I'll show you how to calculate it. Essentially, what it means is the bigger your stakeholder group becomes, the more you engage with the public, the more responsibility you have to report on your business operations and put that information in the public domain. So if you are a very small company, just one person, possibly, and you don't do an awful lot of business, and somebody else checks your financials or puts together a financial statement for you, then there's certain degrees of reporting that, that may or may not apply to you. Typically, if you have a public interest score of over 100, you will need to produce some sort of uh, financial reporting, and you may need to have it audited. I will break this down for you in another slide. Once you get to the point of either being a public company or a private company uh, with an MOI that requires the appointment of an audit committee, then you will need to appoint an audit committee. Public listed companies and uh, or, or public companies and listed companies and companies with a public interest score of over 500 need to have a social and ethics committee. And all public companies uh, need to appoint a company secretary, including state-owned companies. Why would you pick any of these structures to conduct your business? Why would you pick to a company over a closed corporation or a sole proprietorship? It all depends on the circumstances in which you are starting this company. If it's just a small business that you um, have started from home, you want to keep things simple, you want to keep your costs low, then a partnership or a sole proprietorship is, is a very uh, suitable mechanism to operate through. My father-in-law had a motorbike shop and it was just him for a long time and he would go every day and open his little shop and uh, I think he, he mopped the floor himself and he made his own coffee and he find, sold his bikes and he did finance applications and he did the licensing all on his own. And then that business grew and it grew and it grew. And eventually it became one of the biggest scooter and motorbike shops in the country. And he was still running it as a sole proprietorship. And we were very worried because if he got bumped off or, you know, had a heart attack or something like that, all of this was sitting in his personal capacity, this entire business. There was no perpetual succession. It had no separate legal personality. So anyone that he contracted with, he started importing motorbikes and those importers could sue him in his personal capacity. So that was a bit of a worry to us as a family because we knew we were going to end up having to deal with this if something happened. Fortunately, he decided that he'd rather retire than incorporate a company. But when you do get to a, a certain size and you're engaging with lots of different third parties and the assets of the business are quite big, then it's important to relook at that structure and see if um, something more suitable exists for you. Trusts, I cannot recommend that you operate a business through a trust. A trust should be exclusively reserved for holding assets for the benefit of a future um, use 
and that can be um, in a family structure for and you, that trust can exist for a very long time owning assets um, in, in, in businesses on behalf of family members or simply um, in my earlier example of where um, minor children lose their parents and a beneficiary trust is set up to make sure that they're still taken care of. It is not a suitable benefit. It is, ne can never be. You will never persuade me that it is a suitable structure through which to actually operate a business that, that trades on a day-to-day -day basis. Close corporations are very useful things to have if you are a small business and you've got a couple of chums that you want to go into partnership with, uh, but in an incorporated structure, so you've got your separate legal personality. However, the downside is that this is limited to 10. So it's only 10 of you that can do this. If you've got to buy another pizza, then this is the wrong structure for you. You also cannot have any new CC, so you can't register a new CC. You would actually have to buy into or become a member of an existing CC, and that might be quite difficult to do. So if you wanted to open a fashion shop, uh, but you had to go and buy into the membership of a plumbing CC and try and buy out all the other members' shares, I just think that's a very complicated way of going about operating a business. After the um, implementation of the new Companies Act in 2001, companies became very much easier to register. So you can actually go on to SIPC yourself, and this is part of our course, and I encourage you to do that. Go on to SIPC, register yourself as a user, and then you can actually register a company. It will cost you about 150 Rand, and then it'll cost you about 100 Rand a year in order to keep that company going. But you can actually go there quite simply and register your own little company. You will have your little MOI, and you can be the shareholder and the director, and Bob's your auntie, off you go. You can run business through a properly incorporated entity that has separate legal personality you can in contract through that entity so that um, you have protection in terms of your personal status and the company then owns certain assets and has those liabilities so the pros of that is this perpetual succession anything happens to you your business continues to run um, you have limited personal um, liability. However, of course, if you breach that, which we will spend a lot of time talking about, then that corporate veil can be pierced. There's no limit to the number of shareholders or directors that you might have, and your business can grow. Uh, it, you can change it from a PTY limited, a proprietary limited, a small entity, and you can convert it into a big entity when you need to. Uh, if your business is that successful, then that's fantastic. The cons are, of course, is that there is a cost involved. It's not terribly expensive when it's just one of you and you're just paying your 100 Rand every year to keep your company operational. But as you start to get bigger and those obligations around financial reporting become bigger, then that means that you're going to have to produce financial statements and you might end up having to have them audited. And then you might end up having to have an audit committee, which means that you have to um, employ independent non-executive of directors who you have to pay a fee to so it does start to get quite expensive ultimately if you end up being a listed company on the JSC it's it's a very regulated environment and you have all sorts of rules to follow and if you don't follow those rules some of them can actually land you in jail so while it has got a lot of scope to grow and can be very simple when it's a very small structure, it can also become very, very complex and very expensive when it's a big structure. Let's look at the different types of companies. So these are our companies, our incorporated companies that are governed by the Companies Act. There are two distinct sets, one non-profit, doesn't make any money for distribution to its members, its shareholders. It can make money, but it can only make money that it's going to use for its purposes. So essentially, no distributions, no dividends, no investor growth here. 
this is this is a an entity that has a specific purpose and that specific purpose has the all the money has to go towards that specific specific purpose i beg your pardon and not to the uh, growth of the wealth of the members of this particular entity on the other hand we have a profit company and this very much talks to our initial example and and my illustration around the basis of corporate governance being investors who have some money who want to invest it into a business with the purpose of earning more money through the growth of that investment in that business so it is a for-profit company now non-profit companies are dealt with under the Companies Act, they have certain regulations, and then profit companies can, uh, are, are there's, there's four types of profit companies that you can find, uh, private companies, public companies, state-owned companies, and personal liability companies. So I'm going to go through all of these individually. Let me start with non-profit companies. The naming convention is it must have NPC after it, um, at this point, I just want to highlight the fact that there are entities uh, that also run for public benefit for the same kind of charitable purpose that a, a nonprofit might be might be operated for, and they are run by the uh, Nonprofit Organizations Act, and that's where you see NPO being used. Those NPOs are not governed by the Companies Act. Collectively, NPOs and NPCs are in our world what we refer to as NGOs, being non-governmental organizations. So just to make sure that you didn't have enough alphabet soup already, that's the background. But we're just going to deal with NPCs, non-profit companies, which are covered by the Companies Act. So it doesn't have share capital. It doesn't have a pie in the same way that a profit company has a pie. Um, it has members and it can have unlimited number of members or it can have no members. But those members are not going to own slices of this pie in the same way profit companies would. It has to have a minimum of three directors. And if it is a certain size, then it has to produce financial statements. So if it has a public interest score or as of over 350 or assets of over 5 million, then it must produce financial statements. Once it gets to having to produce financial statements at that 350 mark of its public interest score, or it has this increased asset base of 5 million, then it must appoint an auditor. And the reason for this is that that's a lot of money to be sitting in some sort of public interest company, some sort of entity that's purpose is for public interest. So to appoint an auditor means that there is an independent party who is going to be looking at those financial statements and making sure that they're above board and they're compliant with the Companies Act. So it becomes a public interest to know what's happening in that company. There is sadly no job opportunity for us company secretaries in this regard. They are not required to appoint us and they are not required to have an audit committee. If, however, they have a public interest score of more than 500 points, it means that they have a big stakeholder group and therefore they are required to have a social and ethics committee. And that just stands to reason. If their stakeholder group is that big, then there need to be a dedicated group of people who are thinking about how this company engages on a social and ethical basis in its operations. In terms of our profit companies, let's start with private companies. Now, these are our simplest, simplest forms of doing business. It has to have PTY Limited behind its name or Proprietary Limited. That's absolutely fine. You can have one shareholder and there is no limit anymore on how many shareholders you can have. And it has share capital, which means that this is where the pie starts to come in. So you have your slice of pie and um, 
example, you have your entire pie and you slice it up between the shareholders. If it's just you, you get to keep the whole pie for yourself. If you want more shareholders, then you've got to divide up the pie and you've got to agree how you do that. And then those slices of pie will be represented by your share certificates. It can have just one director or it can have more directors. There's again no limitations on these these uh, these numbers any longer. Its founding document is is an MOI, which is the Memorandum of Incorporation I explained earlier. If it has a public interest score of more than 350 points, it will need to have um, financial statements. And once it hits that 350, they also have to be audited. When they are under uh, 350 between 100 and and 349 then they need an external independent review which is like a very clever bookkeeper but not necessarily as expensive as an auditor uh, who comes and has a look and if they are um, uh, and and internally um, a set of uh, financials that are um, put together internally by internal management, then um, they need to be reviewed at 100. There is no, unfortunately, no job uh, opportunities for us in the sector either. They are not required to have company secretaries and they're not required to have audit committees unless their MOI says that they must. However, irrespective of what their MOI says, as soon as they have a public interest score of more than 500, they must have a, a social and ethics committee. Again, that's because their stakeholder group will have grown as big as it has, and they, therefore there is more public scrutiny that is required. Public companies are just limited. The difference being that in proprietary limited, the shares are what we call closely held. The shareholders themselves get to decide who they can sell their shares to. In a limited company, in a public company, those shares are not closely held. They are publicly tradable, which means that the shareholders can sell their shares to any other individual that they want to sell them to. They don't need to go and ask permission from the existing shareholders. Off they go, they can sell their shares. This is where you start to see listed entities. At this point, I'm just going to clarify Lots and lots of public companies exist and they are not listed. A listed company must be a public company, but a public company does not need to be a listed company. Being listed on the JSE, listing those stocks for public trade, is a specific decision that the business itself will make depending on its size and needs. Public companies can have one shareholder or millions and millions of shareholders. There is um, no restricted trade, as I explained, in terms of their shares. They must, however, have a minimum of three directors. We are now talking about a bigger company with bigger responsibilities, so we need to have three directors. There's a little catch to this one, which I'll explain just now as well. If you are on the JSC, however, if you are listed, you will need to have four directors. There is no limitation in terms of how many you can have lots more if you want to. They also have an MOI and they definitely 100% must produce financial statements. These financial statements must be audited by an independent auditor. There is no calculating the public interest score. This is just a must. You are a public company. Your shares are freely tradable. Therefore, you must produce financial statements. They must be independently audited. And yippee! This is where we get our job opportunities because you must appoint a company secretary. You must also have an audit committee at this point. Now, an audit committee requires three members and all of those members must be independent non-executives. You can have more than three, but every single member must be independent. We will go through that. We go, went through that in class one, but you'll see that coming up again in some of our later lecturers. So lecturers, beg your pardon. So it, just to refer you back to that minimum requirement of directors being three. However, 
you can't have three independent non-executive directors and no executive directors. So this board is going to definitely be bigger than three people. You must have a social and ethics committee because you operate in the public, public domain. Let's look at state-owned entities. So these are a little bit like public companies. However, the state is a major shareholder. So the state either owns the whole pie or owns a large portion of the pie. So ESCOM is 100% held by the state, whereas Telcom is sort of 60% held by the state and the other 40% are held, uh, are, are held by private shareholders and it's listed on the JSE. So we, the naming convention is SOC Limited and um, the shareholder, the predominant shareholder will be the state. It doesn't have share capital in the same when when the when the state owns it 100 percent it doesn't have that type of share capital that can be um transferred or traded freely in the same way that a public company can however it is also possible that it can have that type of share capital uh, such as the instance of telcom where share capital was created and the shares uh, are partially held by the state and balance is held in the public domain so typically state-owned entities don't have share capital uh, but in in they also can have share capital depending on whether or not the state wants to sell off some of those shares. Depends very much on the particular entity. The directors will be regulated by the regulations of that specific state entity. So um, there's also the Public Management Finance Act, which you'll remember from our previous discussions. And then in terms of um, particular state entities, they will also have their own legislation. So um, the, the post office has the post office act and the, underneath that acts, it's all sorts of board notices that determine how many book directors each of those sort of entities will require. So it will vary depending on those regulations. They also have an MOI, very much like a public company, but it will deal with share capital or no share capital, depending on how the company is structured. And it will deal with how the shareholder, what powers the shareholder has and how it interplays with those regulations. In terms of the Companies Act, they must produce annual financial statements, they must appoint an auditor, and they must have a company secretary. I think the company secretaries in our state-owned entities have had quite a rough time of it. They must have an audit committee and they must have a social and ethics committee. If they need to have, uh, because they need to have an audit committee and they need to have a social and ethics committee, it immediately tells you that they are definitely going to have to have at least three independent non-executive directors on their board, regardless of what their regulations say. So there's a very interesting dynamic between where the Companies Act comes into play and then additional regulations come into play. Makes it very difficult for state-owned entities because their compliance regime is very, very broad and very specific to those particular entities. Then we have a personal liability company. Now, this is not something you see very often. It does exist and it has LLC after, or, or Inc. And what we see in America, LLC, but in, in South Africa, I beg your pardon, we have Inc, I-N-C. And typically, this is exactly the same structure as a private company. It has the same regulations in terms of shareholders and directors and MOIs and the the obligation to produce financial statements. The purpose of this, though, is that it's typically a group of professionals who've got together, uh, lawyers, medical professionals, architects, and they want to operate under some degree of separate legal personality to protect themselves where there could be liability claims. So a group of doctors working together, they don't want to be sued in their private capacity um, if there's a medical malpractice suit. So they create a company where the company itself then very much like 
a norm and our discussion around uh, private entities, the company would be sued not the doctor in his individual capacity um, and they agree in their MRI how they will deal with those sort of arrangements. Um, this is really only going to be used by professional bodies uh, for that purpose of, of leveraging the separate legal entity. It is not used as a commercial basis on which to operate a company. So if you want to have a fashion show, shop or sell shoes or jewelry, this is not your place to go. If you're a bunch of architects and you want to work together, um, this, is the, this is the sort of entity that you would, you would look at. Now, I talked a lot about the public interest score, so let me explain how you calculate the public interest score. It's governed by Regulation 26 of the Companies Act, so you have your Companies Act, and in the back of the Companies Act are regulations. The rationale for the public interest score is the more stakeholders the company will impact, the greater reporting responsibilities it should have. Remember back to our class one discussions around corporate governance and stakeholder engagement and stakeholder relationships. That stakeholder group can become very big and all of those stakeholders have an interest in how this company operates. So in order to determine really how big that stakeholder group is, we have a little mathematical score and this is how it operates. It's calculated at the end of each financial year and you take the average number of employees you've had for the year. So if you started with 10 and you ended with 20, then your average would be 15. And then you get one point for every single one of those people. So you start with 15. Then you get every one point for every 1 million rand of revenue or part thereof. So if you have 1.2 million rand, that's two points because it's one point for your 1 million and one point for the part thereof. Revenue is also the same as turnover. The Companies Act likes to refer to turnover. And if you are just a silly lawyer like me and you think, what the hell is this? Revenue is turnover, turnover is revenue. It's the same thing. This is that very top number that you're gonna see in your income statement. Then similarly, you get one point for every one million rand of third party liability. This is debt. And this is what you find in your balance sheet. Equally or part thereof, it goes on to say, so in the same way as our revenue calculation, if you had 1.2 million rands worth of third party liability, you would get two points. So now we're up to four points. So we've got four plus 15, so we're on 19 points. Then you have one point for every individual who has a direct or indirect beneficial interest in the company, if you're dealing with a profit company. So if I myself own shares in the company, then I get a point. Or if I own shares in the company through a trust, that still counts, so there's a point there. So now we're up to 20 points. Or if it's a non-profit company and there is a member, every individual who might be a member or association which is a member of this non-profit company equally you would then get a point if you are less than a hundred um and your so beg your pardon so that is how we get to calculating what our public interest score is the impact of that is that where you have less than a hundred points and your shareholders and directors are the same people, then there's no requirements on you to do anything. If you have less than 100 people and the shareholders and directors are different people, then you do need to produce some type of financial report which needs an independent review. An independent review does not need to be done by an auditor. It can be done by a bookkeeper, um, and anyone that would be reasonably believed to be independent. If you have more than 100 points and you prepare your financial statements externally, then you also can only have just an independent review. Your bookkeeper can sign off on your financials. If you have more, however, than 350 points and your shares are prepared, your financials are prepared externally, beg your pardon, then you must produce audited financial statements. 
if you have more than 500 points, you have to have a social and ethics committee. Let's just have a look at that on a little grid. So if you have a public interest score of less than 100, but your shareholders and directors are the same people, no, end, no audit required, no independent review is required. And that's really because the shareholders and directors are the same people. They know what's going on in this little business. If, however, you have less than 100, your public interest score is still less than 100, but you have different shareholders and directors, shareholders have appointed directors to act um, and take care of this company and directors have accountability to the shareholders. So there is some requirement for overview. There's not a requirement for an audit because if your public interest score is less than 100, then you still have just a, this is a relatively small company, but there is a requirement to have an independent review. Once you start getting to between 101 and that 350 or 349, if you will, and you'll have financials that are, are prepared internally by the company, so the company is doing its own books, then you are required to have an audit. And an audit brings an independent re reviewer to the process, but in, in a completely independent way, and it must be done by an independent auditor. So it's a much higher standard than simply an independent review, which can be done by a bookkeeper. So if you're having an audit, obviously, you then don't need to duplicate the process at a lower level through an independent review. Where your financials are prepared externally, so you have hired an independent person to prepare your financials for you, then you don't need to have an audit, you just need to have an independent review, and then that can be done by the same person, and that's fine. If, however, you hit a public interest score of 350, then you must have an audit. There's no need then to have an independent review, because an audit is a higher standard than an independent review. Let's have a look quickly at structures of companies. Once you start getting companies and you start putting them all together. So typically in large corporations, you will have a holding company. And this is the company that then has a whole lot of little subsidiary companies that sit underneath it. So most listed companies have this sort of structure. So Murray and Roberts, for example, you have Murray and Roberts Limited. It's the company that is listed on the JSC, and then it, it owns Murray and Roberts Construction and Murray and Roberts Mining and Murray and Roberts Engineering, and those are all subsidiary companies. Where you see reference to a wholly owned subsidiary, that means that 100% of the shares are held by that holding company. So that Murray and Roberts Limited would own 100% of Murray and Roberts Construction. Wholly owned means all of. Holding companies, however, don't need to own all of the, the shares. They can own a portion of it. So anything above 50% will be considered a subsidiary company, um, a partially owned subsidiary company. So that's 50% and upwards. From 49% downwards, it's no longer a subsidiary of the holding company. We refer to it as an associate or an investment. So that that is that holding company would no longer have the majority of the control over this company. The, the control would vest with other shareholders. Now, this is not necessarily examinable, but it does give you a perspective um, on how these structures are all come together and what certain parts of uh, terminology that you might come across. Here's a little exercise which is quite fun. Thinking back to our green tables of the different types of organizations, independently on your own time, I want you to go through this slide and see if you can identify what scenarios meet with which entities. So here is an example. Uh, water and power is a service provider to local communities and installs boreholes and generators to government clinics. It is a major, its major shareholder is government. What sort of entity would that be? 
that would be a state-owned entity. So have a look and see if you can identify what the other types of entities are. You can always pop your comments into the section below and I'll tell you how far you got to, to right or wrong. I'm now going to take you through um, the sector supplements of King. But before I do that, I want to remind you of the 16 principles of King and precursor that with, with, with this discussion that we've had before. King applies to all of these business entities, regardless of whether they are sole proprietorships or all the way through to big listed entities or state owned entities. However, these 16 principles can be applied in different ways to achieve the same purpose. So at the end of the day, a board should lead ethically and effectively. A sole proprietorship should be ethical and it should be effective, even if it's just one person who's making those decisions. A state-owned entity, equally, the board should be ethical and effective. So it can apply through all those types of business entities. And in order to assist the different types of business entities in applying these 16 principles of King, the King Committee produced the sector supplements. So the sector supplements then try and assist in translating these 16 principles into different types of business scenarios. So I'm just going to remind you quickly of these 16 principles, and then I'm going to go into the sector supplements. So you can see how they've translated King so that it can be used across all these different types of business entities. First of all, the board should lead ethically and effectively, promote an ethical culture and be a responsible corporate citizen. Purpose, risk, opportunity, strategy, performance, business, sustainability are inseparable to value creation. You cannot create value if you don't look at all of those components of your business. Reporting should be done so that all of your stakeholders have the ability to understand effectively the short, medium and long term prospects of your business. The board should be the focal point for custo the focal custodian, the focal point and custodian, I beg your pardon, of corporate governance. The board should comprise a balance of skills, knowledge, experience and diversity and independence. This will obviously uh, vary depending on the size of the company. If you're a sole proprietorship, you must make sure that you yourself know everything that there is to know that you need to know in order to run your business. As your business gets bigger, you probably need to bring in more skills, more diversity and more experience. When you get to a big listed entity that is taking care of billions of rands on behalf of a broad stakeholder group, it's important to ensure that you have the right people who have all of that control. The board needs to be able to promote independent balance of um, power and judgment. So each director must be able to act on their own recognizance and with their own clarity of mind around the best interests of the company. Given all the responsibilities that a board had, it must be able to evaluate its performance and say honestly whether or not it needs to improve in any areas. The board itself does not do the work. The board develops the strategy, but it then delegates the strategy to management to implement. So even in a sole proprietorship where one person has decided what the strategy is and then they tell their employee what to do, they need to make sure that that employee really understands what it is that they need to do and what needs to be reported back. Remember that if you delegate down, you have a concomitant duty to report back up. So you report down to your employees and you expect your employees to report back to you in the same way that the shareholders appoint the board and the board has a duty to report certain information back to the shareholders, which is typically in our annual financial statements and our integrated reporting. The board should govern the way, govern risk in a way that supports achieving the strategy. So risk is the enemy of strategy. And if you want to achieve your strategy, you need to make sure that you govern your risk in an effective way. 
You should govern all the information and technology on which your business is and, and strategy depends. And you must ensure that your business is compliant with all the laws and voluntary codes that apply to it. You must remunerate fairly, responsibly and transparency, transparently in order to promote the achievement and the outcomes and the objectives of your strategy. You must have some assurance process in place. Whether you're a small company or a big company or a sole proprietorship, you have to make sure that all of your internal processes are properly managed and that somebody is checking them to make sure that even in a small business, someone's not running away with cash from the till or in a large business that somebody's not committing tender fraud and then running away with all the tender money to buy a Maybach. And in doing all of this, and running your business, you need to have a stakeholder inclusive approach, which means that in order to make a decision in the best interests of the company, you need to consider what the interests and expectations are of your stakeholders. So with that in mind, let's go through our sector supplements. The sector supplements that have been developed specifically by uh, the committee working on King 4 um, are, have been developed for municipalities, non-profit organizations. So this is not the non-profit company, but it can apply to non-profit companies too. Retirement funds, but this can also apply equally to pension funds and any type of organization that is trust-based that operates through a trust. Uh, SMEs, our small and medium-sized enterprises. At this point, I just want to point out to you that SMEs are the biggest contributor to the South African economy. So it is incredibly important that SMEs are run in a way that is sustainable and that is sustainable for the broader society as a whole. Even if they are just small businesses, they actually are the biggest economic contributors. And then state owned entities. These are entities that essentially we invest our tax money in our tax money that comes off our salaries. And we're very sad about every month because it takes so much of our salary that goes to all sorts of of um, enterprises. It goes into healthcare, it goes into education, it goes into infrastructure, it goes into transport. And a lot of that is operated through state owned entities such as Translate. So you would need to know, you want to know that your tax money is being used efficiently. The whole purpose of these supplements is to provide high level guidance to these five types of organizations on how to apply those king principles. The point being that the principles apply to all sorts of businesses. It's how you go about applying them that counts. So King encourages all sorts of sectors and organizations in order to um, to apply these principles and adopt them. So there's 16 principles and 16 recommended practices, and um, each of the principles have been varied slightly depending on what that, uh, that entity is, whether it's an NPO or an SME. So go and have a look at them. It's very important that when you're reading King, go and have a look at what, how they, what the sector supplements look like and how they've translated them. Legislation is ultimately the minimum level of compliance. You have to comply with the law. However, King will always be voluntary. The idea being that if you accept these 16 principles as being good business practices, they actually are going to support your business and ensure that your business has that long term sustainability for yourself, for your investors and for everyone in your community. Governance in King 4 has this higher aspiration around society and, and serving a greater stakeholder purpose. But they can be applied proportionally depending on the size and entity of uh, the size of the entity and the complexity of the entity. So what you will see is where companies are not required to have an audit committee, then King says, think about having some independent person outside of your organization or um, outside of your, your executive board looking at your financials, such as a, a finance committee. 
if you don't have to have a social and ethics committee, still make sure that somebody in your organization is looking at how that company interplays with its stakeholders, um, with its customer base, uh, ensuring the health of its employees, ensuring that it, it doesn't breach any environmental codes and how it impacts the environment as a whole. So there's this proportional application that you can take from the King reports and recommendations and you can apply them on a proportional basis to your business. Let's look at municipalities. So the macro view and benefits of good corporate governance for municipalities, um, these are really a foundation of democracy. So in that governmental structure that starts with the constitution at the top, and it rolls down the government's responsibilities all the way down to the people, the municipalities is really the place where the, the rubber hits the the road, so to speak. Municipalities are there to deliver those services to the communities, those services that our tax money goes towards. They are accountable to the communities that they serve, and they must provide these services to communities in a sustainable manner. They must promote social and economic development and promote a safe and healthy environment. They must involve communities and organizations um, in how the local government is, um, is run. So um, you'll often see community leaders being involved with municipalities and being part of municipalities. In terms of organizational uh, terminology, so when you read King, you will see that they don't refer to a board, they refer to a governing body. And that's because they don't want to leave it just restricted to companies in the context of a company. They want to, to it to apply broader, so to trustees and to municipalities and to all sorts of other organizations. So they have a generic term. So in terms of municipalities, the organization or what would be analogous to the company is the municipality. Uh, the governing body or board would be the municipal council. Management or the CEO would be that municipal manager. The chair would be the speaker. And the external auditor of the municipalities is um, the Auditor General of South Africa. Go and have a look at their website. They actually do an awful lot of good work. They're a Chapter 9 uh, organization. They pay an awful lot of attention to their corporate governance. And um, familiarize yourself with the work that they do. They are the auditors of record for all of these state-owned entities. Municipalities don't have shareholders, but they do have community members who are involved and who, who have a degree of responsibility and regulation over the municipalities. Let's look at nonprofit organizations. Again, this can be translated to nonprofit companies or collectively what we refer to as a non-governmental organization or an NGO. Their idea being that this is an organization that provides some sort of benefit, um, a charitable benefit, a social development benefit, altruistic, out of the goodness of our hearts benefit. We're not looking to make money out of this. We're looking to serve a higher or a greater purpose by providing goods and services, typically where uh, the state or the private sector has not been able to do so. So the state obviously falls short quite often. Uh, the private sector doesn't always have the capacity or the strategy to engage uh, in its community and its stakeholders the way it does. So you have non-profit uh, organizations who fill that gap. The one that comes to mind that you're probably quite familiar with is Gift of the Givers. Go and have a look at what they do. It's a very good example of um, filling the gap. They essentially assist government to achieve their objectives. Um, they help citizens to voice their aspirations and their concerns to policymakers. There's an organization called Section 27, which is very good at bringing um, the voiceless people, uh, giving them a voice, giving them a platform to take government to court and to pursue their rights. Um, the, dreadful story of Michael Compape, the little boy who fell down the pit toilet. His parents were represented by Section 27 in pursuing their claim against the government for, for that absolutely tragic event. 
Um, they also have uh, organizations that um, enhance accountability and transparency of government programs. So they actually go and assess government programs and then they put information in the public domain as to whether or not those government programs are living up to their objectives. There's a very wide range of these organizations. And if these organizations have got such a, a broad stakeholder base and public interest at heart, one would like to believe that good corporate governance is applied in those organizations themselves. So you would hope that Gift of the Givers and Section 27 are aware of the King Report and the, the, the 16 principles and have found some way of um, applying those principles on, on, on a proportional basis. In terms of terminology, when you look through the sector supplements, just to give you some guidance, that organization or company would be referred to as the board or the commission or the company or the trust. The governing body would be a board or whatever the appropriate term was, depending on how that NGO or NPO had been, had been constructed. Management would be uh, determined by the organization itself, as would the sort of role of the chairman. Um, the auditing function would be if it was based on in terms of the um, the nonprofit company structure would obviously have to be audited. Otherwise, the organization itself would have that responsibility. The shareholders is, uh, would anal be analogous to the members, the donors and the community stakeholders, depending on the type of organization and um, who they were involved with. So go and have a look at different types of NGOs. They can be structured very, very differently. Ultimately, challenge yourself to think about how those 16 principles of King could really add value to how that organization operated. Let's look at retirement funds in their sector supplement. Um, retirement funds could also be considered pension funds, life insurance companies. These are also sometimes run through the trust structures, um, but they represent significant value, particularly when you get to very big ones um, like Stanlib or Alexander Forbes. You contribute your pension funds to these organizations. They ultimately end up in these organizations and then they become what we refer to as institutional investors and they need to translate, take, take all that money and invest it into the stock market. You would hope that, that those entities sitting with all that money would be making decisions that aligned with those 16 principles. Those are crucial investment decisions and um, and they have a big impact as shareholders on how businesses operate. So they can make demands on companies. And more and more, we're starting to see that um, pension funds and retirement funds are not prepared to invest in companies that don't have basic um, environmental policies in place because they believe that the impact of climate change is so significant that it will impact the sustainability of these companies. So they don't want to invest people's money in companies that could be out of business in five years because the environmental impact has been so big on these companies. So think about it from your, your own um, perspective when you hand over that bulk of money to your provident fund or your pension fund every month um, with the hope that you'll be able to retire you also hope that those people are going to invest that money wisely and you hope that there will still be a world for you to retire to uh, when one thinks of the the impact and the significant impact that climate change has so you kind of hope that these investment entities are taking these things very seriously um, the terminology when you go through these sector supplements, um, organization or company is really sort of like the retirement fund, pension fund, provident fund, annuity fund, preservation fund. Uh, it depends on, on, on the, the structure of that organization. Um, if it's a retirement fund or a provident fund or pension fund, it will be governed by the Pension Funds Act. And the, that then also dictates what the board looks like. The principal officer is a little bit like the CEO of the fund um, and the fund can appoint a chairman. It must have an external auditor. 
thank goodness we're giving all our money to these people. Please, can they have an independent auditor look over their um, financials and make sure that they, they're not running off with our pension money? Their shareholders would be the members of those funds, the employers who sign you up when you go and work for Avenge, for example, and they make you join their provident fund or their pension fund. Um, Avenge would be the member of the of that particular fund. And um, you would hope that they would be looking out for those members. Um, ultimately, it's in your benefit. In terms of SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises, as I said, these are the this is the real lifeblood of of the South African economy. And um, during COVID, given the fact that these are also the businesses that have been impacted so significantly, um, this is where we are going to see the biggest amount of damage done. SMEs are also the biggest employers; they're the biggest creators of employment. Um, to, to the South African economy. So as they've been impacted by COVID, so that has um, played through into our um, unemployment rates. So when you look at small to medium sized enterprises and you think, gosh, you know, they've got a lot on their plates, they're small businesses, they really they really need to, to be sustainable, uh, but you don't want to burden them with an awful lot of bureaucracy. So how do you take those 16 principles of King and translate them into what works for a small business and depending on the nature and size of that business? They are the drivers um, of the growth and inclusiveness of the economy. They are also the biggest social transformers, uh, given that our demographics in our big public listed entities still very poorly reflects um, embracing diversity. Diversity is, is, is um, really engendered in small to medium sized enterprises where people have had to develop their own businesses. So we really need to protect these entities. They're also innovative and entrepreneurial. They generally are the designers of new types of technology, software, different uh, improved processes, which they can then sell into bigger industries. Uh, and they are such an integral component of our economy. So in terms of the terminology, when you go through the, the sector supplements, that organization company will be a company, a CC, could be a sole proprietor, could be a partnership. Um, the board will be, depending on whether or not it's a company or a CC, uh, obviously, if it's a sole proprietorship, there'll be no board. As will, you know, the the appointment of the CEO, will the chairman, will um, the auditor, um, and the shareholder regime will all be dependent on which company structure uh, that SME operates through. But ultimately, I'd like you to challenge yourself to just look at those sixteen principles and say, right, you know, if I wanted to go and open a business now, a coffee shop. How would I take those 16 principles and apply them in my small business where it's just me, just my sole proprietorship? And what type of value would they add? Um, I still need to discharge the principle, but how would I go about doing that? How would I go about being ethical or considering risk, governing my technology, remunerating my employees fairly? Just because I'm a small business doesn't mean that those things aren't equally as important as they are when you get to a big business. It's just about how you go about doing it. So I encourage you to, to familiarize yourself well with those sector supplements because it's going to give you a solid understanding of how you take those principles and you turn them into a long-term sustainable value add for your business. And finally, that brings us on to state-owned entities. This is really a heartbreaking story for every South African citizen. So much of our tax money goes into these entities and they really should be doing well. They should be, they should be organizations that flourish. Um, and it really is sadly because of poor governance that they have not flourished. They have no reason not to flourish. We have a fantastic um, infrastructure system where, where businesses could do very well if it wasn't for corruption. So if you took those 16 principles of King and you just really honestly expected our state-owned entities to apply them, they would do really, really well. Business is relatively easy for them. They've got a, they've got a captive um, 
supply chain, they've got captive customers, they've got captive shareholders, they don't have to go looking for these things like small enterprises do. So they really should be able to be very uh, well efficient and efficiently run and provide the South African citizens with, with quality services. So they create this underpinning of this economic growth. They should be the biggest employers that we have. They should be the industries that generate the biggest amount of income. And they should be the industries that um, address social and economic changes significantly. They have all of our tax money, so they have that captive investment. Every money, every month they get money, they, they have access to money. It's what they do with it that counts. And there is an expectation from us as citizens. We are the customers of these state-owned entities. And I have to say, I mean, really, are you as a customer of ESCOM happy with the service that you provide, that you are provided? Or if you are a customer of PRASA, are you, are you happy with the train services that people are expected to use and, and are provided with? And if that was NetBank or that was a uh, MediClinic, what would your response be? I mean, you would you would be on 702 very quickly to complain about about that type of service. So there's so much value that those 16 principles of King can um, give to to our state owned entities if they are embraced. When you go through the sector supplements, just to give you the terminology again, you're going to see state-owned entity, commission. The board is now called the accounting authority, which aligns with the uh, PFMA, the Public Finance Management Act. Um, and the members of the board or the accounting authority would be analogous to that, that CEO type of role, depends on the regulations that um, apply. Uh, the chair it would be determined by the organization and the uh, regulations that apply. The external auditor will always be the Auditor General of South Africa. Again, go and have a look at their website. They actually do some very good work. And the shareholder will be the state. Again, it can be a, a state owned entity with no share capital where it's 100% held by the state. Alternatively, it can be a, a, a um, an entity that does have uh, share capital like Telcom, where the state um, has passed part of those shareholdings. And then the state is referred to as the executive authority. So when you're reading the sector, sector supplements and you see executive authority, that means the state. So good luck reading those sector supplements and go back and have a look at how they relate back to the original uh, 16 principles that we discussed. And I'm quite sure after having gone through these first two modules, you'll be really very familiar with King and, and feel quite comfortable. Try every day, every day, think about something you've heard on the news, think about the King principles and think about how a particular king principle might have avoided some sort of corporate failure or might have enhanced some sort of um, part of governmental systems or some part of the economic systems and functions that operate. Try and apply these things in practice because once you apply them in practice, that's when you start to really get a solid understanding. And if you have a solid understanding of these principles and you can really apply them, you're just, you're just doing yourself such a great favor as a student and you will be well on your way to to your board exams so so good luck and i will chat to you next week